This again, uh, The Peril of Politicizing Science, written by uh, a woman, uh, Krylov, uh, who was born and bred, came of age in the Soviet Union. She's a chemist. She's a PhD chemist, working chemist, uh, and has written this paper. Uh, and as, as she says in this, uh, this, is not, this is not what I want to be thinking about. I'm a chemist. I want to be thinking about chemistry. Um, but in this, I have three short excerpts that I've highlighted here. Uh, one is... Simply put, we should evaluate, reward, and acknowledge scientific contributions strictly on the basis of their intellectual merit and not on the basis of personal traits of the scientists or a current political agenda. Boy, that seems obvious, and yet it is not the world we are living in. Furthermore, she writes, the issue of science moralization and censorship is older than 20th century totalitarian regimes. For example, Giordano Bruno was canceled, burned at the stake in 1600, because his cosmological views were considered to be a threat to the dominant ideology. The guardians of the truth, his prosecutors, quote, had the desire to serve freedom and promote the common good. A century later, Leeuwenhoek self-censored his studies and reports for offensive content. In that case, the offensive content was, I kid you not, observations of spermatozoa in semen. In 1911, Marie Curie was ostracized for immoral behavior, an affair with a married man following the tragic death of her husband, Pierre Curie. Curie. The chair of the Nobel Prize Committee, Svante Arrhenius, whose name I'm no doubt butchering, wrote to her advising that she had should she not attend the official ceremony for her Nobel Prize in chemistry in view of her questionable moral standing? Curie replied that she would be present at the ceremony because, quote, the prize has been given to her for her discovery of polonium and radium, and that, quote, there is no relation between her scientific work and the facts of her private life. Today, we regard this attempt to cancel Curie on the grounds of her moral impurity as utterly absurd, yet we continue to witness the intrusion of moral arguments into the scientific domain. This, again, a point that I made in that Aereo piece that we've talked about, what, what if we're wrong, we, the censors imagine that they are God, that they have a vantage point that no human being before now has had. And so just one last section here. The answer is simple. Our future is at stake. As a community, we face an important choice. We can succumb to extreme left ideology and spend the rest of our lives ghost chasing and witch hunting, rewriting history, politicizing science, redefining elements of language, and turning STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education, into a farce. Or we can uphold a key principle of democratic society, the free and uncensored exchange of ideas, and continue our core mission, the pursuit of truth, focusing attention on solving real important problems of humankind. So what has happened in COVID is the explicit politicization of science and the weaponization of the idea of science so that it is wielded at people who don't quite get what science is, and that includes a whole lot of scientists, by using the, you know, the hashtag follow the science and by Fauci saying, if you disagree with me, you disagree with science, and people buy it because we are effectively uh, illiterate with regard to science as a society at this point. And um, just let, let me just say something about the NIH before, before we riff on this. Uh, most science is now big science, meaning that it costs a lot of money to do. And that doesn't mean that big science is better science. Um, best science is not expensive science. Um, it's just the business model of the modern university. The business model of the modern university has meant that the science that is promoted, the science that is encouraged from the very moment you enter graduate school until you are you know, getting full professor tenure, full professorship, uh, is encouraging you, if you are a scientist, to do, to do science that is expensive. The kind of science that, that you and I did in the field was explicitly um, low-cost science. And you know, big science, small science makes it sound like those are indicators, those adjectives are about importance, and they're not. Basic science, similarly, right? Like basic science is that science for which you don't yet have an idea of what the implications for human, uh, human flourishing might be. What it is is, I see a pattern, I want to know what explains it, I'm going to try to figure it out. And so certainly trying to figure out uh, the, the underpinnings of tent making in bats in rainforests in Panama, or the sex lives of poison frogs in the rainforests of Madagascar, that was basic science, right? You know, there was nothing there that was about, um, you know, drug discovery or, you know, or, or anything else. Um, but what it does, in part, is A, it increases human knowledge, but it also increases the facility of the brain that is doing it such that if you as a graduate student start off already on someone else's mega project because that is the kind of science that is encouraged to be done because that is the business model of the universities, you never get a chance to say, wait, how about this? 
what about if? And as a result, those people who are getting PhDs who got shunted into other people's labs who have big NIH grants and NSF grants and are just expected to do little tiny pieces of puzzles that the PIs, the principal investigators, and their mentors are already doing, never had the chance to actually become scientists. They don't know what they're doing at a really really necessary level. They may fully understand how to do the methodology that they were trained to do. And presumably they know how to read the literature, I hope, and interpret it and make sense of it. But the absolutely necessary kind of unteachable part of the scientific method is, I see something, I'm going to try to explain it. What are all the possible explanations for that thing? That is this hard to explain to someone else how you do it, but utterly necessary part of science that is being tamped down by the business model that is now that is now dominant. So university professors, so just a little bit about how it works is university professors or researchers um, usually get these federal grants, again, usually NSF, NIH, the branches of NIH, the branches of NSF, DOD, that sort of thing, that they need to do their work. Um, and they don't receive those grants directly. They are fed um, directly through the grants offices, which take uh, an overhead rate. And I, I should just, I guess, uh, truth in advertising here. I actually worked at one of these grants offices between uh, earning a bachelor's degree uh, in anthropology and before starting my PhD uh, in biology. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I worked at the grants office um, at UC Santa Cruz for a year. And what I saw there shocked me, shocked me to my core, such that, before I say some numbers here, such that eight or nine years later or whenever, after I'd um, gotten my degree and I was applying uh, to jobs and I had made the short list at a couple of institutions, including Evergreen, and I was now on campus doing like this two or three day interview. And the committee that was doing the hire was before me. And one of the questions they asked me was, when do you expect to apply for your first NSF grant? And without thinking carefully enough about it, although I'm now pleased that I did this, I said, oh, I really don't want to play those games. Now, at most schools, that would have been the death knell for me as, as a candidate. And at Evergreen, you know, this, this is part of why we have defended what Evergreen was and could be before it got gamed. At Evergreen, it wasn't because we, we weren't required to do the game playing with NSF and NIH uh, that everyone else does. And I do have more to say, but I see you want to interject. Yeah. First of all, I want to say when Evergreen was founded, it was understood, actually, there was a certain amount of suspicion about grant getting because there was an understanding of the kind of corruption that it, it brings uh, to a, an intellectual environment. Um, yep. And that was largely lost uh, at the point that we were there. Yep. Um, but there was, you know, there were still some people around who, who got it. Um, but I wanted to point out that what Heather is going to describe about the way this works and what it drives inside of the university has resulted in lots of stuff that you have encountered, but you don't realize that it's playing this role. So for example, if it is true that professors are, <clears throat> are valued by their schools in large measure based on how much money that they bring in, because that money, half of it or more can go to the university, right? It's the thing that builds the buildings and pays for everything. If that's the thing that is prioritized, then what you end up is accumulating, you end up accumulating a whole faculty full of people who see things in terms of big experiments. What you don't get is theory. And I don't mean theory in the way that that term has been abused, but I, I mean that you don't have theorists. And basically the point is science involves an oscillation between hypothesis generation and test. Ultimately, theories are the product of this if a test goes sufficiently well. But the point is, you can't cut the theorists out. You cut the theorists out, you're no longer doing science. And when you describe um, these people who work in these big labs and they do their very narrow thing, I would say, it is not that they don't know how to do science. They know how to participate in science, but they can't do the whole process because the process is an integral process and they've done one little aspect of it. They're like an assembly line worker of science. And that's a very dangerous phenomenon. But increasingly what we have are whole faculties that are staffed by people who've come from one side. And the thing, you know, I, I regard myself as a theorist as much as I sort of want to roll my eyes when somebody says they're a theorist. But nonetheless, it's, it's most of what I've done that's important. And 
The problem is the theorist would never say that we could dispense with the experimentalists. They That's would right. never think of it, right? The, the experimentalists are fundamental to figuring out which hypotheses were right. You, you just can't cut them out. But the, the experimentalists very often see their work as primary and the theory as annoying. And so what they do, you know, because what does a theorist really need? You know, they need access to a library. They definitely, pencils are good. You need a chalkboard, right? You probably want some PowerPoint software, but it's not expensive stuff, right? And so, the, you know, the idea of uh, what do the data say, data-driven, all of these things are actually cryptic Metrics first. Yep. Right. They are an attack on science as a large process that works because the method is so robust. They also insist on controlling absolutely as much as possible, which is part of the scientific method, but they regard any investigation in which you cannot, by virtue of the question, kind of squidgy and not quite scientific. And so I would add to your theorist versus experimentalist or theorist versus empiricist uh, distinction, um, because I, you know, I'm, I'm much less of a theorist than you are. You know, I've had my moments, but I'm much, I'm much more of actually like a hypothesis generation experimental design. I'm, yep. I'm, I'm particularly good at experimental design, but it's in places where you cannot control all of the noise. So there's an inside-outside um, dichotomy as well. There's an empiricist theorist um, dichotomy, and there's an do you do you work in the lab or do you work in the field? And that's not to say that all lab work is reductionist. It's certainly not. And that's not to say that all field work is um, inherently holistic or well done. It's certainly not. Uh, but doing work outside, asking questions of systems where you have not gotten rid of all the things that you think are extraneous, and guess what? Maybe some of the things you got rid of that you thought were extraneous were actually the explanatory factor you were looking for. When you're outside, you have to deal with so much more of the noise of the system that you have to get really good at, at seeing pattern and at um, understanding when hypotheses are actually alternative to one another as opposed to subsets of one another and at figuring out how it is that you would design an experiment that would really tease apart two hypotheses as opposed to kind of answer both and leave them both on the table. Like that that work, as much as the particular, you know, my my particular findings about three different kinds of male territoriality in Mandela Levigata, for instance, just to name one of the things that I discovered, you know, at one level, who cares? Okay. Um, but at another level, it was exactly that work that trained me um, through just, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, living in the rainforest to figure out how to discern possibilities when, and, and also to see when all the possibilities aren't on the table. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, uh, there is something else. You want to finish that and yeah, then I'll come just, back to it? Let me yeah. just finish this. Um, so... <clears throat> One thing I learned at that grants office um, that I worked at for a year between uh, undergrad and grad school back in the early 90s was uh, that there's an overhead rate and there's a lot of different rates. But um, broadly speaking, the overhead rate is the rate that the university, that the researcher who is applying for the grant works at, uh, will take before the researcher ever gets any of the money. And it makes it makes sense, right? Like if you are hired, um, even if you are tenured and you're getting your salary from the university, um, but the fact is if you're doing you know big science, you're going to need you know big lab, you're going to need a lot of real estate on the campus, all of this. And so the university um, does have a reason to be uh, to have be able to say, hey, you know what? Some of that grant money that you're getting has to come back to us, and we're we're actually going to not just make sure the library is in excellent shape because you're using our library, aren't you? But also make sure the walkways are in excellent shape, and you know everything else associated with the university. We are going to take our overhead, and we are going to apply it to whatever we feel like. Like we are not responsible for applying it to anything in particular, uh, for the most part. Uh, for research done on campus by um, by um, at American universities, um, and the university just takes this overhead before the PI ever has access to it. Again, the PI is just the principal investigator on the grant. And so I just did a brief search uh, for university overhead rates, and then had to had to make sure that I was looking at again um, because there are so many types research done on campus in American universities, and the five that popped up first. I was not being selective. I just, the five that popped up first, there was one that popped up in the middle that 
had a very confusing table and I couldn't make sense of it. So it's excluded, not because it didn't fit, but because it didn't make sense. Um, UT Austin, the overhead rate is 58.5%. That is to say that for every uh, million dollars that a researcher brings in, 585,000 of those dollars go to the university and the researcher never gets that. At the University of Utah, it's 52.5% is the overhead rate. At Harvard, it's 69%. At the University of Washington, it's 54.5%. And at USC, it's 65%. I saw nothing uh, below 50 or above 70. And that's um, it's actually a little bit of a climb. I couldn't find my notes. I did take notes on what I was seeing back when I was a... Uh, work in the grants office back in the early 90s. Um, but my memory was that they were between 40 and 65, that there were at least some that were below 50. And I'm seeing none that are below 50 at this point. Um, so you know, what does that mean? It means that the universities have an incentive to encourage the biggest research possible, because the more grant money that comes in, the richer the universities get. That is going to mean, for instance, that scientists who have the capacity to bring in big research are going to be favored over scientists who aren't, which is exactly the point that Brett was making. It also means that scientists in general are going to be favored over other kinds of faculty. And one of the ways that, that favoritism happens is by relieving scientists uh, disproportionately of some of the other responsibilities of being faculty. And in general, what faculty are required to do is three types of things, research, teaching, and governance. Governance meaning the kinds of stuff that helps the university run, being on committees, helping do hires, helping decide, you know, whether or not a new department needs to needs to be established, et cetera, et cetera. It's largely thankless work. It takes time away from what you really want to be thinking about, largely, because if you're faculty, you have chosen not to become an administrator, probably. Um, so it's administrative work that faculty are required to do. And one of the things that universities do in order to reward scientists who are bringing in grants is relieve them of some of their governance load. What does this do? This means that faculty in other disciplines, for instance, fill in the blank studies disciplines, the grievance studies disciplines, are more represented in governance roles. And so since big money, since NSF and NIH grants have been driving university protocols for well nigh on half a century at this point, we can expect that what you see is governance by people in disciplines who don't know science, who don't do science, who don't understand it and don't respect it, being more and more responsible for making the decisions that decide the future of universities. This is at least one big piece of why it is their universities are in as big a mess as they are now.